Yeah. There's a bit of sand in there yeah, and then the for whoever. Oh, yeah. yeah, all right. No. What are you doing? Yeah. The Delaney's are all having lunch together. No, Mary, you have a pan. Uh, no, I, I have Are you a, having some salmon? Yeah, I have a salmon. Six brothers and sisters, all in their 50s, 60s and 70s. I thought she wasn't going to do anything. My mother and my aunts and uncles. You don't know Anne, Phil. Ah, the I've brought this year to you. Yeah, no matter what's going on, for opening of an envelope, she'd have a drink. That house there with the grey galvanised roof. That was where we were real. Yeah, kitchen, a kitchen in the middle, parents' bedroom one end. We, we slept in the end room. In iron beds. They are right near where they grew up, in Clannad, County Leash. And the meal for the chickens were kept in big bags in our bedroom, and during the night you could hear the mice eating the meal. And then my mother put down to kill the mice a big thing of uh, the stick on them. When you go up in the morning, behold, about seven or eight sticky dead mice. And the M7 motorway passes nearby and there are only a few miles outside Port Leash. Well, that's very lucky. Yeah, we were lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> we're all sitting around the table in Dick's home with his sister Phil, who's my mother, and their siblings, Mary, Teresa, John Joe and Catherine. They are here to catch up. We got denim jeans. We were the first oh. in Ireland to have denim jeans and tights. <laughs> but they're also here because of a box. I had to clear out the house after my mother died and uh, amongst an awful lot of stuff that she had collected over the years, uh, I found that box. It's a small wooden box that used to be owned by their mother, my grandmother Nan. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's so resident, yeah. I think the first thing is just the smell of my granny's house. It's still kind of there, present in this box. It's kind of turf and bacon and, yeah, brown bread or something like that. Inside are newspaper cuttings, letters and a notebook. I've never seen that before. Yeah. In one way, it's unremarkable. But for her, it was very special and she always kept the box private. She had never talked about anything in the box. When we were little children, we used to see this brown wooden box, but we were never allowed to touch it or see what was in it, and we knew it was always really, really secretive. So when she died, I know it's probably sad to say that we couldn't wait to get our hands on the little box. When they opened it, my mother, aunts and uncles discovered an archive of their mother's life and their lives, and a memory of a really difficult time. Is that in the box? It's in the box, yeah. And while it's interesting for me, because it's the story of my family, it also gives us a window into life in rural Ireland in the 1960s. A time when the rest of the world was discovering the Beatles and space travel. But in parts of rural Ireland, like this, there was no running water or electricity. Nan Whelan was born in 1916. She was one of a family of eight. Her father worked on a railway and they lived just outside of Port Leash. She, she actually had diphtheria when she was a child, which was fatal a lot of the time, I think, that time. But she spent many months in a sanatorium in, in Abbey Leaks uh, with the diphtheria and she recovered. But I think that left her with her lungs. She had seven sisters. And when she was very young, she had to go to England to work with her other sisters. In the days before Facebook, smartphone and selfies, people communicated with each other via letter. Family news, local titbits and gossip were recorded there and made its way into long detailed letters sent and received several times a week. In Nan's box of letters, for example, are love letters written to her when she was in Manchester by a young man back in Clannad named Johnny Delaney. In one letter, he thanks her for a photo she had sent him, I suppose the selfie of the day, and remarks of the photo, I can see everything in that face. See, that's her photo. See her up there on top? When she was, when she was only 15 or 16, 16 of that. 
I'll be seeing you in all I suppose with the one that looks most like her. Yeah. She had jet black hair. That this heart and mind embraces all day through. I'd say she wasn't much more than five feet tall. Ah, yeah. she yeah. worked out, was she? Yeah. Her birthday was the 24th of December and she always used to tell me that it was the shortest day of the year to match her because she was short. Yeah. <laughs> she had a beautiful complexion and she would never, ever... We all had kind of dark skin and been out in the country, but she didn't like that at all. She's keep your skin out of the sun. In every lovely summer's day, in everything... The relationship with Johnny Delaney developed. I'll always think of you that way. And because of that, and the fact that Manchester was being bombed during the war, Nan returned to Clannad, and she and Johnny married in 1944. A year later, they had a daughter, Anne-Marie. One of the first items to come out of my grandmother's wooden box was an envelope relating to her. She has a little note in the envelope, a curl from her hair, a flower from her dead hand. It's a little white flower placed in Anne-Marie's hand when she died. Wrapped in tissue paper. She was never strong. Mam said that she, she couldn't feed because her jaw was damaged during delivery. She was a forceps birth and, and the uh, damage to her face. Yeah. My mum said she died from starvation because she couldn't suck. She was born the 9th of May 1945, and she died the 25th of May 1945. But she didn't talk about her. She never talked no, about she her, no. About her, no. Yeah. I remember her birth. Yeah. 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 No, She's buried no. up into that graveyard just up the road, and there's no mark on her grave or anything. There was also another baby. Martin. 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 What happened to him? He was... Um, overdue and he was he delivered by cesarean section. He was 10 months, uh, he was a month overdue when he was born dead. Yeah. Well, Mam must have been strong that time. I mean, that was, you know, she was very sick. So even yeah. When Catherine yeah. was born, she was sick. The small box also contains a notebook John Joseph, happy where Nan recorded details of her children's lives. Walking at 10 months, talking at 15 months. Size six boots at one and a half years. <laughs> when we were born, when we got our vaccinations. Richard Anthony Delaney, born in Port Leash Hospital on Monday, June 17th, 1946, at 10.20am. Weight at birth, seven and a half pounds. And it goes on to talk about your first tooth. Um, first drink. Ten teeth at 12 months. Walking at 14 months. Talking at... <laughs> I was walking at 10 months. That's what it says, yeah. Walking at 10 months, yeah. Oh, no, I was sorry. a very advanced child. First tooth at five months, sitting up and saying dada at six months, walking at 15 months and talking at 16 months. And you never stopped. I never shut up since. But perhaps the most surprising thing for the Delaney children to find at the bottom of their mother's box of keepsakes was a packet of letters. It looks very like the pages out of a school book. Dear Mummy. All written in childish handwriting. Dear Mummy. Dear, Dear Mummy. Dear Mummy. Clannad Wednesday. Clannad, the 9th of the 4th, 62. Catherine is well and she wore her good pink cardigan Sunday. It fits her lovely. The station is in the school Saturday and I hope I will be going. Mary does my hair every morning. Sheila's ducks are laying and she can't keep them off the road. I will end my letter now. Goodbye now. The letters are all addressed to their mother, Mrs Anne Delaney, St Edith's Pavilion, Piemont Sanatorium, Newcastle, County Dublin. Often at night time, she'd be coughing blood and we were absolutely terrified as children. And I remember as a small child, I'd stay awake all night to see was she going to cough. The doctor would be called. Now, the doctor very seldom would come to the house mm. in that time. You wouldn't be told anything that she was sick, but you knew the doctor came and went to the room where she was sick. That was mm. the only way we knew. I remember her getting sick. I remember the hemorrhaging beside the fire. 
I remember we were all terrified because she was coughing blood. You cycled down to Killeen's, I think, to get them. They had a phone. They had the nearest phone. Yeah. I can remember my mother leaving the house, the car, the big car, stopping at the gate, and my father and my aunt bringing her from the door to the car, and she was crying. When she was being wheeled out, she said, uh, I think I'm going to die this time, and I'll, I'll never, ever forget those words. And my father said, say nothing, but that stuck with me all my life. Mm-hmm. And I uh, heard my father saying to her, uh, think of the children, think of the children. Nan, think of the children, don't be crying. But of course, she probably was thinking of the children all the time, yeah. The car took Nan to Dublin, to Newcastle and Piemann Sanatorium, a place associated with Ireland's TB epidemic. A teacher in school said to me, we're all praying for your mum. And it's only then it hit me because I didn't realise it at all, like how bad she was. While Nan is in Dublin, Johnny is left behind with the six children. <laughs> there were very difficult times because we lived on a small farm my father had a job with CIE, so he had only a day and a half, a half day Saturday and a Sunday off. When my mother was in hospital, he had to continue working. Mm. And uh, he hadn't great coping skills domestically, mm. though he was a great worker on the farm and on the bog and in his job in CIE. And he had very difficult time and there wasn't much help. Mm. He couldn't cope and that was typical of men at the time. Mm. Was, I wouldn't blame him for that, you know. Nowadays, with home appliances like washing machines and ready-made food in supermarkets, it's easy to forget that the division of labour on a farm in the 1960s was a division of particular skills. Nan going to hospital in Dublin meant that her skills were gone from the house. She baked our bread every day, white and brown bread every day. And she made butter and we had our own vegetables. And in October, we had this religious ceremony in school and she always had new clothes for that, always new cardigans. She made the dresses or whatever we wore. Every Sunday, she cooked a fruit cake yeah. for Sunday. Now, the fruit might be a little bit scattered in it, but it was still, it was still a lovely fruit cake. Of all the responsibility Johnny and his children had now that their mother was gone, the most pressing was, without a doubt, the latest born, baby Catherine. I don't know how she survived. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you all for looking after me. (laughs) I can't imagine what it would have been like to be left with a a very young baby to mind. Really, you know, fair play to you from me. (laughs) When we were feeding her, we fed her on bottles of cow's milk and Marietta biscuits. We never gave her any proper. I don't think she got any proper solid foods at all. Johnny, their father, had to go out to work all day. So a decision had to be made about who would mind the baby. I was the eldest girl. I was 14. And because I was doing my junior cert, that's why Phil had to stay at home and look after the baby because I had this exam to do. I took a year off school to mind my little baby sister. I was 12. At the time their mother went into hospital, the six children ranged in ages from six months to 15 years. The older children were acutely aware that with Nan out of the house, everyone was struggling. Because you were in a cot beside the bed in their room and if you cried at night, Daddy had no patience with you and he used to shout at you, shut up. And we were terrified in the other room listening to this. I just lie rigid, just willing you to please stop crying so he he could sleep and everything would be all right. Clonad, Wednesday. Dear Mammy, we are all very well here. Catherine is going on great. She is very big now and she can sit up by herself and she can crawl along the bed. She still eats as much as ever. Auntie Noreen is very good to us and she visits us often. Catherine doesn't mind her now. She laughs and smiles at her. Goodbye now from Mary. And this is from Catherine, her first scribble. (laughs) What's on there? That's that's my letter, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah, I got you to, your hand to move with with the pen, with the yeah. pen over the paper, <laughs> so that she'd have some uh, contact with her. Yeah. Yeah. When Catherine started to uh, stand up, pull herself up, we were trying to mind her, and Dad got this tea chest, this big timber tea chest, and put a um, a pad in the bottom of it and put Catherine into it, and and that was in the kitchen with Catherine in it, pulling herself up, and I always remember her looking out over the side of the tea chest in the kitchen. <laughs> At one point, there had been some discussion about sending Catherine away to be looked after by an aunt who lived in Rosslare. But I'm always, always grateful that uh, my father's sister, Auntie Kit, didn't bring her down to Rosslare because then she would have been totally... And was that an option? Was that yeah, that was an was option, yeah. yeah. And then we, my, my father didn't want it anyway, but, well, she probably would have had a good life, but... <laughs> <laughs> Live beside want, the sea. We didn't want that either. <laughs> You might have been fed better. <laughs> More than Marietta biscuits. Clannad, <laughs> uh, the 9th of the 4th, 62. Dear Mammy, I hope you are getting better. We all wrote letters to her at the time. I miss you very much and I am praying hard for you every morning and night. I am nearly better now. I got up yesterday. but I, I had a great time. day in Dublin. The spring show was great and there was a lot of... I can now, not remember writing the letter to my mother. Yeah. Uh, I was very emotional there when I saw it. Yeah, sure. uh, I was yeah. very, uh, very moved. Yeah. By it. And I am saving up for a camera. It cost 25 shillings. We will soon be doing the elementary exam, but I am only doing it in English. We are all very well here. Phil was sick for a day, but Theresa stayed at home. I only missed Monday when I had to do the washing. We got our holidays. We all missed her. And the only way we had of communication at that time, there was no phone <laughs> or nothing like that. So it was only by writing letters we could keep in contact. Condon had an operation in Dublin Hospital last night. A wire steel hoop hit him on the head and his face is destroyed. Begging it now. Phil found a pigeon's nest and came running in to tell the news and I went and found it. That happened today. Daddy shot a crow in the corn this morning. I found a robber's nest. Clannad, Wednesday. Dear Mammy, I hope you will be home soon and are nearly better. supervised the letters. No. We wrote them ourselves. No, wrote them ourselves. No. Yeah, completely that was it. Yeah. We wrote them ourselves completely off our own bat. Nobody coached us or told us what to do or what to write. The children may not have been told what to write in the letters, but in their chatty details in these letters, they must have connected their mother with a small farm in Leash, as well as giving us a snapshot of rural Ireland in the 1960s from a child's point of view. Dear Mammy, I got your letter and I'm glad to know where all the clothes are. We are having beautiful weather here now and Daddy is working hard, spreading manure and cleaning the drain. They are getting on great with the work. He got another week off. I got a letter from Auntie Mary in Scotland and she sent me two postal orders each, worth 10 shillings, and that's a whole pound. Aren't I lucky? Phil has six chickens out and one white turkey and they are all eating and drinking fine. I wrote to Auntie Mary and told her how you are. Catherine is a fine baby now. She's as fat as ever <laughs> and as cute. Granny is home and she was down to see us twice. She is looking great and is asking for you. All here are keeping great and John, Teresa, Phil and Dick and of course Catherine are very good. Goodbye for now. Love Mary. Five kisses. And there's a note from my father at the end. He says, love from Johnny. We'll write later. Sending you 10 shillings. Hoping you are keeping up well. All are well here. God bless. The granny referred to there was their mother's mother. She lived nearby and called him frequently. Granny could be a bit strict at times. <laughs> she had old fashioned ideas. Well, OK, at that time, right, you know. And even though she was in her 70s, she looked like a really, really, really ancient woman because long ago they used to wear black when their husbands died. They were always a widow, you know. But she was a great 
consolation to us in talking and things like that. You know? She was just an old, she was an ancient woman, to me anyway. But uh, people weren't soft that time anyway, were they? Like, you know, couldn't be. Just different times. Those different times sound a bit like another world to us now. But the Delaney children recall that despite the fact that they lived in a tiny farm with no electricity and no running water, they were a lot better off than other families in the Port Leash area in 1962. Where that house is built, that house, that was our land. The Delaney's, at least, had food. You didn't have much money, but you ate well, because there was a few acres there and there was enough for vegetables and whatever. So we always ate very well. There was terrible poverty in the country at that time, but not so much out in the rural areas where people grew their own food. In the towns, people came out begging, begging for for a few turnips, a few eggs, a few potatoes. They had nothing in towns. I remember it. I remember coming out with 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 a big... A big yeah. pram, this particular family, yeah. and uh, no roof on the pram, and they'd have whole lot of children. And they always got vegetables, milk, anything we had. She always sent out, so, some of us out to the garden to get maybe a head of cabbage or turnip or something to give to them. All this, they were never sent away. And we brought inside into the kitchen and... Um, We'd them a mug of tea. And yeah. given a cup of tea, yeah, yeah. Mm. For the, Corn was for the, yeah. the, for the mill in Port Leash, the, the, the yeah. maltings in Port Leash, yeah. and that then would provide enough money to last the winter time for everything. And then my mum always had turkeys. Did you say something to mum about one time about the turkeys being quite vicious? Oh yeah, whether they knew that they were coming near their end of their days, but coming near Christmas, if you went out in the field, they would come chasing after you and you'd be absolutely terrified. You'd jump over the gates and everything, uh, like an Olympic runner, just to get away from these turkeys. They were vicious, absolutely vicious. I had uh, two pigs. One died from overeating. He was like a big fat pig. But with the one that was left over, I got my first second-hand bike and I was able to cycle into school in Port Leash. I wish you were home, but please God, you will be soon. We say three Hail Marys for you in school every day. When Mum went into a pea mount, we weren't really told what was wrong with her. We were told she had to go and that was it. But we never told what was wrong. But the teacher, Mrs Donahue at the time, she started telling us how, telling me, I remember anyway, about the seriousness of the operation and how it was touch and go, whether she would survive or not. I remember being really frightened about that because we hadn't heard and it wasn't talked about at home. Like it was just, everything was going to be all right. But um, I, I know she prayed for ma'am at the time, but <laughs> she did give us a bit of a fright. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Their mother's illness may not have been spoken about openly. But for the Delaney children, the fear was that she was a victim of the TB epidemic, which in the previous 10 years had killed almost 10,000 Irish people. The other kids would be mocking you about having your mother having TB. That's the way it was then. Again, you knew about the stigma about it, you know. You didn't know a lot, but you knew about the stigma about it, you know. Mm. So it was there, definitely. Clannad on Tuesday. I'm going to school every day now. I got two slaps today for being on the wall. While my mother had to stay at home to mind the baby, for the other children, school was still a central part of their lives. There was a cement wall around the school and you weren't allowed to go in the field outside the school. So if you were on the wall, it meant you might be just going out to the field. So you got slapped for that. She had the sally rod up behind the, the picture over the fireplace and you got a couple of slaps. Every now and again. She had a sally stick. We had to go out and cut the stick in the ditch For ourselves. Our own and a slap across the palm of the hand. Mm. If you didn't have your Irish done or your sums done mm. in the morning when you went into school. Yeah. Or if you were talking in class or did anything out of the way. I think we got a good basic education in reading, writing yeah, and arithmetic. sums and arithmetic. Mm. I think it stood as well when we went on mm. to secondary school and yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Really, really good, basic primary education. Along with the beating. Yes. Dear Mammy, it's a pity that I have the carrots. I forgot to sow the lettuce you told me to, and it's wet now, so I better wait. The books are going from the school. 
I found a blackbird's nest and there were young in it. They flew away, but there is an egg in it now. I found a robin's nest in the wall of the shed. It had two eggs in it and Teresa put in her, put in her hand and the robin deserted it. <laughs> there is one egg broken now. We planted the potatoes yesterday. Bye for now, John Joe. I love the kids, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to fill the space up. <laughs> We all had our own bird's nest. So if we found a bird's nest when we were going down to get the cattle, just bring the cows up, and we found a nest, that would be ours. Nobody else could have that. I'm not sure now what many years are between the oldest and the youngest. Sitting around the table in Dick's house, as you can imagine, everybody remembers things from 1962 differently. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, when I asked them, with all the work that had to be done, if they had much time to play. As long as you did your little bit of work that you had to do, you were free all summer long. All well, summer long. We were now with the bog. We had the bog. Oh, yeah, the, the bog. bog. We had awful the work on the bog. Just from the bog to the hay, back to the bog again, yeah. and back to the hay again, and, and then the you were back home. in school. Yeah. <laughs> and the thinning the And the thinning the beef. The thinning the beef. The yeah, picking potatoes. In, my birthday was in October, and I remember spending one birthday out picking potatoes all the whole and the birthday. potatoes were black colour, so you couldn't see them when the light was going. They were black. They were called Scary's potatoes that they're not done, and they were as black as the clay in the drill, and you had to pick them all up. This sounds as if it was a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound so long ago, and reading the letters, it does sound yeah. like so long ago. It it's does. surprising it's, when it's, it's the 1960s. Dearest Mammy, I was delighted to hear you are going on well. Mary is back at school now and I have all the house to myself. Daddy is very good. He sweeps the floor. <laughs> Mick Dorn went to town Monday and now he is very sick again. Sheila had to get the doctor for him. I got a new pig, but it is not as big as mine. Didn't I tell you I'd have a good one? Daddy got teat out. He got a new saw. We are finished sending the milk to the creamery for the time being. There is only four chickens left and one of them has a crooked foot. The hens are laying very well. We got 11 eggs yesterday. Two of the ducks, one laying. Number six is going on very well. Number six here refers to the sixth child in the family, Catherine, the baby. Daddy gets her a package of biscuits every night. I got my hair cut and now it is very nice. Goodbye now and God bless you from Philomena. Philomena, my mother, was 12 at this stage. My responsibilities were just feeding the baby and getting the others, I suppose, out for school and that. Phil and the older children stressed a lot about the farm and the house. Mm. There were very tense times, as mm. far as I can remember. Mm. But it didn't seem to be the same for Teresa and John Joe, who were 10 and 11 in 1962, when their mother was away in hospital in Dublin. We, 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 were, we were playing very, across the field all yeah, the time. We, we spent a lot of our time together, <laughs> even though I have two older sisters. We spent most of the time playing together, outdoors. In the field. We'd we be on the field all day, two of us. Yeah. We used to bring out and make little jumps with the sticks, you know, pick the sallies and make the jumps and then we'd make the higher ones oh, and the yeah, lower yeah. ones and we'd, we'd mm. just compete with ourselves all the time. So we had our, I suppose we had company and we didn't have the responsibilities of the older. Yeah. I remember one time that John, we couldn't wash John so we tied him to a chair and we washed his face with a dirty face cloth. A small kitchen chair. I don't remember that. <laughs> But the work on the farm wasn't spread evenly throughout the year, and there were periods when the Delaney children had time on their hands. My father would go to work, and when he'd be gone out in the morning, because we were only children during the summer holidays, we'd take out cards and we'd start playing cards all day till it was time for them to come home again. We had no television, so we had nothing else to do to keep ourselves happy. I remember him coming home from work and we had been left on our own all day and the fire was out. You had to keep the fire going. But of course, we spent most of the day playing cards. <laughs> he came home expecting a, a, some sort of a meal after working hard all day. There was no meal and the fire was out. And 
I don't blame him for flying into a bit of a rage. <laughs> As regards cleanliness, I say, in the house now, we, we threw everything into a corner. But the mess in the corner was more than just a matter of tidiness or hygiene. It could also be taken as a sign that the Delaney children were not being looked after properly. And that carried the risk of the family coming to the attention of the authorities, church or state. My father, when he go out to work, he said, if anybody calls, you just say that your father's down the field looking after you because we could easily, and I often say to my sister, have been taken into care if, if somebody realised that we were on our own all that time, especially with the influence of the Catholic Church at the time and the parish priest going up and down on the road and we were all waving at him. It's just, th- that was no worry then. We didn't know about that. But now we've often said that in, the, in a number of years past that, we could have easily have been separated and that would have been off. Things would have been so different Mm. for us. Mm. But we were kept together. And I never knew why my father and mother used to say, when you're anybody, any man or woman calls to the door, you just say your father's down the field working. And that was why. I remember one day we were playing out in the yard and a guard on a bicycle, pulled up at the gate. The gate was closed and he pulled up outside the gate. And uh, I remember him saying to me, where's your mother? And I said, she's in hospital. Where's your father? He's at work. Who's looking after you? And and I remember saying to him, nobody, we're looking after ourselves. And he went off on the bike. And I just thought after I'd grown up, we could have been taken into care. Anything could have happened to us. Radio Erin. From now until one o'clock, it's hospital's requests. Dear Mammy, your request wasn't on so far, but maybe next Wednesday. I will listen to it, won't you? Now, I'm going to try to get through as many cards as I can this morning, so here goes. For Aidan O'Reilly, who's in the Richmond Hospital, recovering after an operation, wishing you a speedy recovery. Best wishes from Maura. We sent in a request for her. But I don't think they played it. In County Donegal. And Darren, I believe that you were to make your first communion on Saturday the 26th. I'm very sorry to hear that you're missing that, but I hope you'll be out of hospital soon. I was the eldest girl, I was 14, and I missed Mam terribly. I was at a very vulnerable age, and I remember just missing her so much. I had this pen friend, and um, she wanted a photograph of me. I remember, and I, I had no self-esteem. I, I was looking at this little black and white school photograph and thinking, oh, I can't send her that. I look terrible. And um, I think I wrote to her in the letter asking her what would I do or where would I get a nice photograph, where I could have got some reassurance from her that everything was all right and that I didn't look as bad as I thought I did, <laughs> you know. While it was clear from their letters that their mother wrote back to them often, unfortunately, none of these letters survive. Monday, Clannad, dear Mammy. Sheila has only three goslings out of 18. Hard look for her. Two, Mick is going on great and might be going to work on Tuesday. Mrs Dawn is in bed, sick. She has a septic flu. As the nurse says, they are all very good to her with bottles of whiskey, lemonade. <laughs> no wonder she stayed in bed. <laughs> Dick sends all his love and John too. He wed the carrots this evening. It's a great job. My birthday is very soon. Will you be home for it? Mrs. Don gave me a lovely summer skirt. It is a bit too big. The heifer milk's great and we have plenty of milk now. Anyway, the cows stay out in the pasture all night. Catherine has nine big teeth. I give her an egg in a cup every morning. The pigs are got terribly big. Now they are able to eat enough now anyway. Myself and Granny did the washing today. There are some pansies out in your garden. The lilac is in bloom everywhere. Catherine is able to say Mary now and able to say Day Day. 
the meadows are very high now and the corn. The jack toss have little ones in our room chimney. Granny washed my hair last Wednesday. I will say goodbye now. Your loving daughter, Philomena. Do you know what I notice about all the letters? And it's really sad. We First of all, we talk about the daffodils and the flowers in the spring. And then we talk about the meadows. And we talk about the, all the fowl getting bigger. And we talk about the... Uh, corn and we talk about the pansies in the garden so it's summertime and mam is still gone you know that's really sad yeah. nowadays clanad is just off the m7 and on the m7 you can get to piemont hospital on the dublin kildare border in an hour in 1962, Peamount was much less accessible. There was absolutely no transport in our family at all, but one of my uncles, he would drive an old Ford Prefix car. It would take hours and hours and hours and then to get from Port Leash up to Peamount. I wasn't told at the last minute that I was being allowed to go. It was like going to a foreign country and... Um, it was great to get out of home for the day. It was um, excitement and anticipation after seeing Mam after all those months. In 300 metres, turn left onto Piemont Road. My aunt said, they didn't let you, a child in, so your mum will come down and meet you at the wire fence. No sign of fences or anything now, it's all very open. It's beautiful countryside right here. Isn't it's it? lovely, yeah. That over there seems like part of the old building, but I, maybe that house there would have been, yeah. And it was something like coming in from the roadway there and stopping at this older fence and uh, just talking to her through the wire fence. But no modern buildings like this at all, then. And were other people out and about? Did you see people no, around? No, I don't remember. I was so concentrated on what I was going to say to ma'am about... When would she be home and little things like that, you know, little childish things. I remember going up in Bernie Farrell's car up to the gates and waiting outside the gates and my father would go inside and he'd be gone a while. Then he'd come back with my mother to stand inside the gates, the big iron gates, and look out at us and you could talk to him but you couldn't touch him. Um, do you remember what you told her, what news you had to tell her? Of j just... Oh, the chickens and the hens and the turkeys and the flowers that were in bloom and the seasons and that in our garden. So that down there is probably the main entrance, I'd say, where we came up. And along that hedge there was probably the fence I'd talk about. And did Granny ask you about all your siblings? Ah, yeah. She was asking how were we getting on at home and how were we managing the washing and the cleaning and the cooking. And was she emotional? Ah, very, yeah, yeah. But she was trying to hide it from me because she didn't want to let me see that she was upset too. So how did you know she was? Because there were tears in her eyes. And how did you say goodbye to her? Just through the fence and she walked away and I walked away. That was it. I was looking forward to going for something nice to eat and childish things as well. Dear Mammy, I got home safely Sunday and I was delighted to see you. We went down to Pat McGill's five miles outside Dublin City. We got lovely tea there. There are six chickens and one turkey out. They are real hardy and I had them out in the yard. The corn is All of this chat about the farm and local news hid the fact that the children were worried. I can't imagine what it was like for them, for their mother to be away and even more so, to not know if she would ever return. My pig got sick. It would not eat, but it is all right now again. As it happened, Nan Delaney turned out not to have TB, but she did have a serious lung disorder, and the treatment involved having part of one of her lungs removed. Granny comes down every day to us. The weather is very warm. and I On one of her visits, the children's granny had news. Somebody got in touch with her to say the operation went okay. Then, 
After six months away, word came to the children that their mother was about to be discharged. And I remember the day she came home. We were waiting for a long time. We had Catherine dressed up and we were walking around with her and we found this pink dress hidden away somewhere and we dressed you up in it and a little knitted cardigan and we were so proud of you. We took you over to Mrs Dunn across the road to show you off. I remember that. Just eventually she came in the car. We all found it a little bit strange. We sort of stood back and, and it's like as if she was a stranger. And it took us a little while to get used to her again. It was easier for the older children, but the baby, Catherine, had no memory of her mother. And she screamed like Mam was a total stranger and, and just to get her to look at my mother again. So that took a while, you know. Yeah. Catherine was crying and I went into the bedroom and she was standing in the cot and she, uh, I stood beside her and she reached her two arms up to me uh, for me to lift her out because Mam was in bed, of course, and she found her strange and she, she made it strange with her. And I remember saying to her, it's all right, Catherine, it's only a mammy. And I could see my mother's two eyes shining in the dark at me and she's just looking at me. That, that memory sticks in my mind. While it's a strong memory for Mary, Catherine, who was a baby, has little, if any, recollection of the time. I knew she was in a hospital when I was a baby, but I don't have that memory of it, so I wouldn't have that, I suppose, maybe as emotional as you would have had. Because she never talked about it. Yeah, once no. she came out, she never mentioned it again. No, no, that was, that was it. Back to normal work. Normal. The baking and the cooking and everything. Yeah. And washing proper clothes, it was back to normal. Although Nan was back home with her family, she hadn't just left a hospital behind. In Piemont in Dublin, she was also part of a small community and convalescing there, she got to lead a life with other adults free from family responsibilities. She was different when she came back. She, she looked well and her complexion was better and she didn't have that rugged country look, mm. you know, and I think she missed... And odd times she mentioned the friends that were there. It must have been lovely to be in a different world for a, for a few months. It must have been so different. No, no, I was jumping I the bed in her, there I, and I... I, I she I, in the door. I yeah, the door. We are down outside the old house, which is right beside the new house the Delaney's moved into later. <laughs> so that's where we moved to in the 60s. Nan and her husband Johnny reacted differently to the move. And I remember yeah. when uh, we moved to the new house, uh, Daddy was missing one evening and went down. He was sitting down in the dark in the old house. He, he didn't really want to move. It was belonging to his uncle, you see, the, the old house. And that's where his parents and all were born. And he just, he found it strange moving up to the, didn't the new like house. Change. No, he didn't that like change. It. That was it, yeah. Mm. But mum had painted, while, we, while that house was being built and we were living down there, and she had painted the whole house herself mm. before we moved in and we never even noticed, we wouldn't have even noticed that she was doing that. She did it during the day, like when we yeah. would have been in school or whatever. She had the whole house painted and ready to move into it. My granny's box of letters is closed now. The letters provide a window into an anxious time in my mother and her siblings' life almost 60 years ago. Somebody said, uh, well, it's James Heaney. He lived through uh, medieval times into modern times. Mm. It's like that, wasn't it? Yeah. A bit. yeah. The correspondence that Nan saved is also an archive of a life. We keep the things that are close to our heart. And was it moving into that house, was that a big deal? Oh, it was a big deal, yeah. We didn't know how to use the inside toilet, we still went out the back. <laughs> <laughs> Are you being honest now? No, no. she's not. <laughs> <laughs>